I want to show you some footage and some photos of a $19 million concrete house that looks like it is the most perfectly architecturally pleasing piece of work on the planet. Perched over the Blue Pacific, 400 I-beams in the roof structure alone. It is, well, it beggars description. I had never considered anything like it, and I hope you enjoy getting a look at this masterpiece. So you guys know that I'm a fan of concrete. One of the reasons I'm a fan is because it is the world's most versatile building material. You can build swimming pools, you can build countertops, you can build boats, you can build parking structures and freeways and Roman Colosseums. There's pretty much nothing that can't be built with concrete. But let me tell you what, I got to look at some pictures the other day that gave me a whole new understanding of what it means to build a house out of concrete. I've got Barry Muscle here with me today. One more time. He showed me the pictures of a house that his brother built in Hawaii. And I, and probably you, have never seen anything like this $19 million beachfront property. So I want you to tell the people about the building that your brother Prince, is that his name, Prince Muscle? Yep. Mm -hmm. And he's doing business on Oahu? Yeah. Okay. Sounds like as remarkable a guy as his brother is, Barry. And he got, <laughs> he got tangled up with a project like... I don't know who has ever had to do something like this. Tell us about this house, how big it is, but the challenges around building a gorgeous, an architecturally spectacular, not just utilitarian, but yeah. spectacular house, totally out of concrete and steel. Can I say concrete and it's steel? Concrete and steel. Yeah, Give good. us the evolution of this, boil it down, and kind of help the people understand what they're looking at in these pictures. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the client wanted, it, it, it is a earthquake and hurricane zone, Earthquake meaning seismic, meaning tsunami, meaning as bulletproof as you can build it. Exactly. And he wanted it concrete. And of course, as you see the pictures and you see this roof line, I don't think I've ever seen a house of that complexity done in concrete. You don't see many houses of, out of wood of that complexity in the roof structure. Absolutely. So it was a real challenge. And um, all cast in place, the exterior walls, interior walls, everything uh, formed and poured cast concrete. Uh, the, the second floor is all, you know, red iron and uh, rib deck and six inch concrete slabs for the floor. And then the entire roof system, over 400 I-beams just in the roof system alone. Hold that thought. So for, if you're not familiar with concrete construction, cast in place means you build the forms, you make sure the rebar is in the right place, you make sure in this case that the electrical chases and the chases for the plumbing and everything that need to be inside the wall are inside the form, and then you fill it up with concrete and you consolidate it so that it fills up nicely. And in the roof, the rib iron he's talking about, around here we call pan deck, and it's a heavy corrugated galvanized steel product that holds the concrete up and provides tensile strength in lieu of rebar in many cases. And it's hard to work with even when it's flat, I know. Tell us some more about this. Well, you've got all these facets of the roof plane, uh, and it's on a 312 slope. Thankfully, only a 312 only slope. Only a 312. Uh, but you have to, you know, pour it and screed it. And of course, obviously the concrete wants to run downhill, so you've got to pour this as a really stiff slump. Let me elaborate on that. What he just said is you use a stiff slump, a low slump, because you're pouring on a slope. And when you screed it, you're scraping off the top in order to get it into shape, and it wants to run down the hill. So a 312 pitch, oh, about like that, and probably about a number three slump or a two, and they had to screed it uphill, no doubt. You have to screed that uphill. Well, yeah, they what, tried it both ways. They tried it. What'd they end up with? They ended up going from the top down Did most they? of the time. Did they use a roller screed or just hand no, screed? hand screeding. Wow. But plenty of men. Yeah. And uh, it's an amazing deal. It took them forever. You know, I say forever. They, they got a system and they, initially it was challenging, but then they got a system down and they just methodically worked their way through it. Wow. But wow. an incredible house. An incredible house. And you can see by the pictures that this thing is square, plumb, and true. It, it's not a situation where close counts. It's a situation where it's got to be nice, and they got it nice. So I'm thinking of doing a skate park. Skate parks are daunting <laughs> in concrete, but they're only just so big. Right. And this right. house goes on and on. How big was that house? I'm try I, I think it was right at 12,000 square feet, but then it had a uh, caretaker house. It was uh, 1,800 square feet caretaker wow. house, and, and both on right on the water. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Uh, anybody would kill just to... Live in the caretaker house. Just live in the caretaker house. <laughs> but the, the thing about this structure, too, it had lanai's. They're cantilevered out. So you, you're talking about 
steel cantilevered out with concrete slabs on it. It cantilevered out 14 feet. 14 foot cantilever. And the, the overhangs on the roof, you know, the, the, the sun is a challenge in tropical climates, so they have, tend to have large overhangs. And so these had some huge overhangs, all cantilevered concrete. And that's all where, the detailing that was required to do that. That's where the, the I-beams came in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How, Couldn't how, be done without that. How many I-beams? And do you remember any of the sizes or anything? But you said there was a lot of I-beams in this thing. The, the roof alone had 400 I-beams. Did you hear that? 400 I-beams in the roof structure. And the sizes varied all over the place. Sure. You know, the, the smaller, shorter span purlin beams would maybe be an 8 or 10 inch beam, and the yeah. others were, were large. Large, so. supporting a cantilever. Mm -hmm. Cantilevers on top of cantilevers sticking out over the ocean. They, they have a height limit in Hawaii. Oh. Because, you know, the, they're, they're mountainous. So uh, everybody wants the ocean view. So you're limited on your height. Okay. And you can't build to block someone uphill's view from us. So sure. You have to really watch your height limit. So that's part of the reason that the 312 pitched, sure. keep the profile lower. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the old adage in, in structural design is deeper is cheaper, it's more efficient being to be taller. Because of the height limits, a lot of these were squattier than what you normally would do from a structural design standpoint, but heavy pounds per foot. Yeah, yeah, the, so, oh, back to the eye bream. Heavy, heavy in section, mm -hmm. thick webs, right. thick flange. Right. And so he, he had some welders there working for a long time. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And you got involved with sort of redesigning some of the connections after right. your decades of, of um, structural and roof work in the American Southeast. By the way, if you haven't already seen us talk about that, you ought to check out his Bible, the Roof Cutter's Bible. This man knows how to build a roof structure. But back to our story. So you had to, you had to turn your head to connections with I-beams and uh, pan decking and all kinds of stuff. Well, this often happens with engineers or designers. They get rightly focused on one thing with it, to the exclusion of common sense. Yeah. So in this design, it was very important to have a good structural connection between the walls, which were shear walls, preventing racking of the structure, and the concrete diaphragm of the roof. Which is heavy. Very heavy. But he needed that connection. So he wanted the, the concrete wall to run up right to the bottom of the, the of concrete the slab diaphragm. of the roof. So he detailed these 400 I-beams where this big overhang, you know, six feet, seven feet, nine feet overhang Hanging out there. were welded to the wall. So instead of having the I-beam run through like a regular rafter, he had it where the wall went all the way to the, to the roof deck oh. and the I-beam was welded to an embed plate in a the weld concrete. weld plate cast into the wall. And then the overhang also welded into an embed plate. No. So could it work in a perfect world? Maybe. Maybe. But there'd could be x-ray testing of all those welds and everything? Holy smokes. The incredible stresses on it. And I took a look at that and I thought, you know, this is a welder's nightmare. You do it this way, ugh, yeah. this is going to be tough. So we uh, prevailed upon the engineer and uh, we drew up some alternatives and we got him to approve them. Block out the wall. We blocked, the beam runs through. We blocked it out. We the put an embed plate in the seat. Yeah, wood form, so it's a very easy thing easy. to uh, to set that uh, wood template with an embed plate fastened to the bottom on it. Big one inch thick embed plate with studs welded on the bottom. Nelson studs cast down in, in place yeah. and on then, the right pitch. So with the, the I beam. So you didn't have to bird's mouth the I beam. It would just make contact. Yeah. It would play with the fit up. And we would leave the the rib deck, uh, the pan deck as you call it, back, and so. Uh, you know, the concrete from the roof deck would pour right down. He had it drawn where the walls were, had a pitch on them with, with these embed plates and sure. everything. And it'd be a nightmare to form. Sure. Or to, or to pour. And now you got a cold joint. I mean, you got two different, yeah, so you're just tying it all together. So, and we still, we would put scrap plywood, or they would yeah. put scrap plywood around the beam. So sure. when you poured the roof deck, it filled, completely filled the beam pocket encased. around the eye beam. Yeah. Completely encased. So he had his shear wall connections. You know, yeah. that's not compromised a bit. But, you know, a relatively small design change Worlds probably of difference. cut by 60% the, the time and, and labor yeah. and everything required to do yeah, it. Yeah, what a win. All right, now let me ask you this. Consideration for corrosion of those I-beams over time. Were those I-beams painted prior to the, before everything was built? Were they painted and protected against corrosion or not? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they're all in an enclosed conditioned space yes, basically yes. so uh, it's generally they're, they're well primed oh uh, yes 
But my brother did go beyond the spec and use fiberglass rebar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't want that degrading in there in a salt environment. Yeah. Yeah, so you're familiar with what happens to concrete when the rebar rusts? It expands. It gets big, like 100% it can grow and just pushes the world apart. Yep. What a disaster that would be. Yeah. You know, maybe more than 100%. In a comment, one guy said it can be like up to 300% over time. It can get so big. Huh. Interesting. It's amazing. It is amazing. But I was just amazed at the beauty of the house. I mean, the, the strength and the longevity, yes. But the beauty incorporated in that. So as we wrap this up, unless you've got other things to talk about, talk to them about how they made a concrete roof diaphragm really waterproof and really beautiful. Well, they, they followed on the top of the concrete slab itself with two inches of uh, rigid extruded polystyrene foam. So, you know, like a, you know, the blue dowel board is yep. the common, you know, yep. use of it. Not foil backed? No, okay. just, just extruded polystyrene. Of course, it's Hawaii. They really, you know, you've got even temperatures. The insulation is not a big deal. You're, you're controlling condensation as much as anything. So two inches of polystyrene foam with a one inch thick uh, dens glass type gypsum with a special facer material on top. This is mechanically fastened into the concrete slab. Screws or shot or something. It was, it's a big washer and a shot. Yeah. Uh, so they mechanically fastened that and then it gets a, a waterproof membrane. And then it had this gorgeous Italian clay tile that was uh, foamed in place. Uh, used to do that with, with nails or some other fastener. Yeah. And uh, they fail. They wiggle out, you know, in a wood structure, they would vibrate get, loose, you know, loose and pull loose. And they, they found that the foam system was far superior in that in two fashions. Number one, it sticks fantastically, rated, I believe, 160 mile an hour winds. Uh, far superior to the mechanical fasteners they used prior to it, but it has the added effect of giving full support under the clay tile, which if you're walking on no a clay cracking. tile, No cracking. You can go up there and work and not break it up. So it's, it's just a game changer way of attaching yeah. clay tile to a roof. Holy smokes. Well, it's, it, I can just imagine how beautiful that structure is now, that it's matured in place and the landscaping and the Pacific remains beautiful. and. Huh. Nothing more beautiful than Hawaii. Nothing more beautiful. Although than... Oregon's getting pretty close. Well, you come back in April or May. <laughs> Barry, thank you so much. Yeah. What a pleasure Total it's pleasure. been. Thanks for expanding my understanding of carpentry and construction and, and leadership on the job and and a, a, a wider under so that so that's the thing, right? That's the thing that we always can end up knowing more than we know now if we're interested in knowing more. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up that good work.